Um, almost everyone up here today has talked about teamwork, indirectly or directly. I'm going to talk more about what we can do at a local level and what we've done or what I've been involved with and it's a very minor level. No disclosures are pertinent. Uh, why a team in trauma? We think of ourselves as a quintessential lone wolf. I, I'm going to fix my ankle fracture, leave me alone, just get my patient out of the a, a hospital, right? It's not really the way medicine's going right now. Um, I think it's an opportunity, teamwork, to improve care and also ensure professional development, which is hard to do, actually. Uh, we talk, uh, Shep talked yesterday about the ABOS. We have the equivalent Royal College in Canada. They're, they live in this palace in Ottawa. That's beautiful like that. Uh, but they have very little input in like our day-to-day -day work, if you ha what happens if you have a surgeon who's not quite up to par? They don't have any, they don't have any way of doing that, right? And we know it's really hard to learn after residence and fellowship. It's an article out of uh, the Royal Society of Medicine that showed that if you get a new technique or something, it takes about 17 years for people to adopt it. If you don't teach it to them in med school, which is kind of depressing, really. Um, so the best way to improve competency in patient care actually is building a team in your local uh, hospital and it, tra trauma can do that, and we do it all the time. We do trauma rounds, we do self-review, and I think including people in those, that kind of activity is really important at the hospital level. So there's thousands of articles, literally, on teamwork in uh, healthcare. It's, the reason there's thousands of articles is because of that first line there, the magnitude of preventable patient harm in US healthcare may exceed 250,000 deaths per year. There's no real way to uh, like change that number, people think, unless they get teams involved with complex medical issues, and that would help in the, going th forward in the future. So can we do this with team building in orthopedics? Uh, the popular culture seems to believe so. If you have an, a we, you can actually uh, play trauma team. Uh, it's very interesting. You learn how to put a hip fracture uh, t to rest. And even in this, Dr. Schmidt comes in and talks about the pros and cons of hemi versus total. It's kind of a cool, cool feature of the game. Uh, so it's not quite as easy as a video game, uh, building a team in, in, in healthcare, though. And this, there, although thousands have been written, this basically sums up what the shortcomings are. Uh, it, you know, you need a lot of stuff, communication skills and coordination, but what you really need is a collaborative mindset, and that's the hard thing to build. Uh, you, can, you can do that with team building, but whenever you talk about team building in rounds, people just kind of turn off, they don't like it. People have written about it, uh, but people seem to, talk, to buy into a team sport concept if you get to that in orthopedics. <clears throat> what what <clears throat> your team is not, so most people think, oh, I'm going to have a hip fracture team, that's great. Basically what people think as surgeons, they go, someone's going to optimize them so I don't have to see them pre-op, I can just do the surgery and they'll get out of the hospital really quick and I can do another surgery the next day. And that's what you think of team. That's not really, that's one of the side effects of a team, but it's not really what the team does or what the team is supposed to do, right? And what team should you choose to build? Uh, this didn't come up right, because, but anyway, underneath there, Dave Ring built a team. He talked about psychologists. He, he finds a lot of the trauma issues and people who are feeling like end, end of their rope in trauma clinic. And he has written a lot about doing that. And this paper on top is from our center, actually. That's Suzanne Moran, who's the chief of medicine. And she came up with the idea to embed an endocrinologist in our trauma clinic. And she's in every trauma clinic, which, which is really nice. And they wrote about this is in the JBGS a few years ago. And they've actually been able to spin that into a cross-Canada network of research with 250 investigators, of which PRISM's one of them, Emil's one of them, I'm one of them. They, they let a few surgeons in. Nice of them. But anyway, that, so that's where you can think locally and act globally in the end, right? That's just a team that was built in our trauma clinic. So building a team in trauma is important. One of the reasons is we become so subspecialized that we can't take care of the entire patient anymore. People all through the hospital are taking care of our trauma patients, so you need some kind of overview over that. We've kind of walked away just because of time constraints from taking care of the whole patient. And uh, we s sort of need help doing that. And I think there's two levels. You can get the acute care teamwork versus the big picture administration teamwork. The administration one's the one no one wants to do. Emil lives with that every day, I think, as chief of surgery. Uh, it's not the really fun part, but it's a very important part for process. And that's what's important. And we're no longer that lone wolf.
So I'm just talking about one, t one team I'm part of and what, what it takes to make that team work. So you think of a physician's taking care of a sports team as being fairly simple, you know, like the orthopod gets to do the ACLs and uh, then, uh, you know, someone else takes care of the rashes and then that's over, right? But I'm involved with uh, several uh, sports teams. This is one of them. So this is the active medical care team that's at the, uh, the game. About half of us will be at the game. Uh, every time there's a hockey game, we'll be at it. So we take care of 19, 20 to 30 year olds and they're all well and they're motivated. And so why does it take a team to do that? Well, it does in order to make that work. This is the inner group is 23, but we have a lot larger group that takes care of the, the big picture and the people involved, or these are the people involved, you think, people you don't think of, right? So there's a team doc, but there's everyone else, including a pediatrician at every game, because 20 to 30 year olds have kids and they can't go to the walk-in clinic. So their kids, come, we have a walk-in clinic at the game, right? So we had to organize that. You can't just organize that and say, oh, that's gonna happen, which is what people think a team, uh, like a, a team physician does. We have a lot of uh, communication tools, uh, including these that we use every day, and we have a lot of team activities. We do a daily check-in on uh, WhatsApp every day. I get a buzz in about what's going on. We have assigned duties. At the game, we come in, we check supplies. We talk to the first responders, the ambulance care. We talk to St. John, the ambulance takes care of the, uh, the main, uh, big, the big arena picture. We don't take care of that. And we do annual real-time trauma scenarios on ice. We do ACLS, ATLS, recertification. We have an annual meeting at the league level and we have monthly newsletters from the NHLPA. So just taking care of a simple thing like a sports team where everyone's well, this is what it takes. So we've t these, most of these people are trauma people, so we've taken some of that and done that for our trauma team where we have real-time daily check-ins. We communicate, we book patients by what's uh, air table, so we know every minute what's going on and we follow them up to the OR with another app. So we've used some of these principles to take care of our trauma patients too, and it works a lot better. So that's a simple problem. Another simple problem we think of is hip fracture. Hip fracture is the one team that we think we do need. There's multiple medical problems, social, et cetera. You'd like to have early discharge. Team is better at that, right? You're getting patients through, making sure they're well. And what do you do? So how do you make it work for a hip fracture? Well, there's a lot of diverse factors that will promote clinical uh, teamwork, and these are some of them. Um, and this is how you make it work. So a shared understanding of team goals. So you prioritize pre-care, care and discharge. There has to be a, team, uh, a, a, a care map that does that. We have a daily plan, a weekly agenda that helps us with that. We have effective leadership. Someone has to take the ball. You can't just say, yeah, hip fractures are getting done. They don't get done. They get delayed. They get dementia, delir delirium, sorry, not delirium. they have dementia, they get delirium and they stand, stay in the hospital for three months, right? Someone's gotta pick up the ball and run it, doesn't matter who it is, it could be a doctor, a surgeon, it could be a floor cleaner, someone's gotta do it. So, and the things that we did that worked initially were hip fractures were prioritized in the trauma room in the morning, they just went. And if you operate on them sooner, they, didn't, they, they didn't, weren't fasting all day, they didn't get delirious, right? And they were, they were better coming out. That same doctor, Suzanne Moran, who I talked about before, came to us and said, what have you guys done? You guys are better surgeons or something. It's like, no. We just prioritize them to getting done so they aren't sick on the floor and getting pneumonia, right? She was very happy. So try it. I think you should try building a team, figure out what you want to do. Some of these things, books have influenced me over the years, but uh, measure what matters. Measure your outcomes. There's no better way to make your team work unless you measure your outcomes. Uh, this book by Kim Scott called Radical Candor has helped me uh, blunt my anger at many meetings, so it's, it was an important read for me. Uh, does everyone need to buy in? You're not going to get everyone to buy in, right? By getting a majority to buy into your team, you kind of have a broad spectrum of people in your department. Some of them are really don't want to be part of a team. Those ones you can leave on the outside for initially. There's nothing, there's no more paranoid people in psych wards than there is in the research ward where we are like the surgeon scientists seem to be more paranoid than the psych patients. So those people you might have to treat with a little bit of a kid gloves, right? Uh, what, what, what can teams not do? Well, they can't make people do what they, they don't wanna do unless you, you coach the words uh, properly. They can't bring all those outliers into the inner circle, but they can make those outliers look at the average of what you're doing and say, hey, maybe I could be more like that. And that does work where the team kind of sucks people in for that. 
but it can't make up for no resources. But what it does do is help communication, it expedites proper therapy, keeps the treatment current. Like I said, the Royal College can't do that, but teams can in your local hospital, and brings the team up to some standard of what doesn't matter what it is. I say thanks, but uh, my, uh, my approach to my family is my kids. They all play a different team sport, summer and winter, and there's no exception. They can play all the individual sports they want, but they always play a team sport, and I think it's helped develop them uh, to be better people.